Pure Love is an open and honest talk show between a parent and a child discussing sex, sexuality, life, relationships, everything. Um, and uh, we want to share our the ways that we've communicated, um, which is still uh, you know, learning process uh, with you all, um, because we feel like storytelling is a huge part of growth and um, ending shame and secrecy around a lot of issues specifically around child sexual abuse. So this project came about through the HEAL project and it is a project that I founded that is working directly to address and ultimately end child sexual abuse. And the major platform for that is um, comprehensive sex education as a tool to ending child sexual abuse. Uh, and so uh, my daughter and I decided to do this um, show so that we can share our process with other people, the, the, the wonderfulness and the pitfalls of it all. Um, but today we have a special show um, because we have Sonia Renee Taylor um, from The Body Is Not An Apology uh, joining us and she will be interviewing us today. So we have a little difference in, so um, please introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about um, The Body Is Not An Apology. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I am really excited to share this time with you and to talk to you all. Um, about the work that you do. I think it's super powerful. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Sonia Renee Taylor. I am the founder and radical executive officer of The Body Is Not An Apology. We are a digital media and education company focused on radical self-love and body empowerment as the foundational tool for social justice and uh, global transformation. So we really see um, oppression and injustice uh, as manifestations of our inability to make peace with the body, our own bodies and other people's bodies. And we certainly see um, the HEAL Project and Pure Love as an important tool in how we do that peacemaking work with the body. So um, I'm excited to kind of dive in and ask you all some questions um, and, and hear what you have to say. Cool? Yes, thank you. Also, before we begin, we both have fur babies with us. So <laughs> if you hear any barking or shuffling, it's yeah. just the children running around yeah. speaking. Yeah. But, I, I also have a fur baby with me who may decide she wants in on the conversation. So. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, so I really want to start off kind of asking you all about um, the inception and impetus of the HEAL project and the Pure Love series. Like in a, in a world where conversations about body and sex and gender are not only just uncomfortable, but often treated with significant stigma, um, let alone having those conversations uh, with a child and a parent together. Um, it's really groundbreaking work. And so I'm interested in like, what was the impetus for both the Hill Project and the Pure Love series, and if were there fears around doing it, and if so, what were some of the biggest fears? Um, uh, so the impetus for the Hill Project was, oh, it was probably about 15 years ago um, mm -hmm. that I thought of it, and HEAL stands for Hidden Encounters, Altered Lives, and mm -hmm. it was um, really at a time when I was really delving deep in my healing. Mm -hmm. Um, doing therapy, doing art therapy, just trying to just navigate my life. Um, mm. And a piece of that, a huge, huge piece of my healing was performance, poetry, writing. So I wrote a lot of angry, angry stuff. And through that, I developed a show called um, Lagrimas de Cucodrilo, Crocodile Tears. And I was fortunate enough to tour with that show for about four years. And that show was really my story uh, um, and my story as a, a person who experienced child sexual abuse at the hands of a female and I wanted to start something that specifically spoke to um, survivors of child sexual abuse that 
that the perpetrator of a wrongdoer, of a harmdoer, was he. Um, mm. And back then, uh, uh, no one was talking about it. I mean, mm. we were talking about it, period. But to talk about it as a woman doing that, mm. broke all these kind of gender stereotypes about people um, still think women don't offend. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, then that kind of just fell out. I kept talking about it, but that project didn't actually happen. So this time around, with the help of the Just Beginnings Collaborative, I was able to get some funding. And because of the last 15 years of work that's been going towards like um, just um, sexual violence or anti-sexual violence movement and child sexual abuse movement. So like, with, because of that, I was able to have a better platform now to like bring this about. It's not spe you know, specifically about female perpetrators or uh, harm doers, but um, just about um, healing and, and talking about sex education that because that is my platform is sex education um, and then through that pure love because um i wanted to speak directly to parents about mm. um how to talk to your kids about this stuff you know, let's do an online talk show and just have conversations just talk about how i raised you what you loved about it what you hated about it like raw honest you know mm. you argue like so that's where the idea came from. she was like i'm in <laughs> awesome. <laughs> awesome. And so in terms of this collaboration, what has been sort of the scariest thing um, you all have grappled with in the process of putting putting out Pure Love? Um, I feel like for me, my biggest fear, um, and not because I have reservations about it, but because I know how other people perceive things, my biggest thing was because <laughs> This is going to be on public social media. Uh -huh. People would judge me or my mom because they're trans or mm. they raised me. And a lot of times, people just say really ignorant, closed-minded things about them, like or what kind of person I am, or what kind of person they are, or what kind of their lifestyle, or whatever the case. Mm. Is. So that was my biggest issue because I mean, of course, I have no shame. I'm very proud of my mom, but other people are not as accepting. So. That was my biggest fear of having to have all my Facebook friends or Instagram friends or whatever have access to like a personal part of my life. Mm. Yeah. Someone who means so much to me, you know, like I would not, I would, it would like boil my blood if anybody said anything, you know, about my mom. So bad, nobody talked bad about my mom. <laughs> I didn't like opening up that door and maybe you know, like, there's always going to be really bad comments and reactions to things. So I was like, what are the bad reactions going to be? Right. Mm -hmm. I, and I think yeah. really my biggest fear was, of course, family. You know, mm -hmm. I talked to my parents first, you know, and I was like, look, I'm going to do this. Um, are you okay with it? And they were super supportive, uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, because it does you open up your life in a really huge way. It's one thing to yeah. talk about it in a workshop. It's yet another to put it online, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the other fear really was around, uh, it mirrors what my daughter's saying. It was about my the trans identity because mm -hmm. I'm trans, uh, gender fluid or gender nonconforming. I look the way I do. I identify very strongly as a mother. Um, and she calls me mom and that is like, that's going to stay until I become an ancestor, you know, like that is really important to me. And mm. um, to talk about this publicly, I have to talk about my trans identity because what mm. happened to me happened to me as a, as a little girl. Mm -hmm. That's my experience as a little girl. Um, so that was a big fear for me because I am very nestled nicely in the queer community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This brings it outside of that safety. Got it. Got it. Thank you. So I have all kinds of other questions that are kind of off of the um, path of the questions that I sent you from just what you've answered here. So is it okay if I sort of ask some other things that might come up? So um, two things that came up, but one, the first thing that I kind of am interested in, you know, I know that a lot of the work that we do at The Body is not an apology. We're always kind of dancing the line between what does it mean to have our own story and then how does our story fit into a larger social narrative, right? And, and when it fits into that larger social narrative, is it fitting into the one that furthers oppression or is it fitting into the one that sort of furthers liberation, right? And so one of the 
narrative that I think often gets pushed, particularly onto trans and gender non-conforming people, is the idea that their transness is because of trauma. And so I am interested in one, how you how do you feel about that narrative? How does it feel for you personally? And then how do you navigate that in terms of the platform that you have? Yeah, great, great. That's I mean, it's such a great question because really the, the show, Lagrimas de Cocodrilo, was really like um, uh, grappling with, at the time, me identifying as a lesbian, right? Mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. that, it, people would always say, you know, oh, do you think you were because that happened to you? you know, because right. you, don't, you don't go asking, um, um, you know, you, should, you shouldn't ask any person who has suffered any kind of sexual trauma, any kind of question like that, but we don't necessarily ask a, a, a woman, a cis woman, who might have been a, a, you know, sexually assaulted by a man, do you think you're straight because of that? Or, you know, it doesn't mean Right. <laughs> False equivalence. Um, right. So, um, yeah, I don't, I think that there's a mixed bag. Just like mm -hmm. nothing is, you know, it's like there are some of us who um, would say there is no trauma. You know, I know who I am. I know that I am a trans person because I feel it. I know who I am. That's that. You know, um, and I can't speak to people uh, who would say, I can't speak to someone who might say, my trauma informs my gender identity. I'm not sure. I'm not mm. sure about that because that's not my experience. So I don't like to speak of others' experiences. Maybe in the sense of safety. Um, I, have, mm. I, have, I have heard someone who might be, um, uh, you know, like a yeah. uh, very feminine. After a traumatic experience, it needs to be down for you, right? Because of just not, because putting that on the right? If I look different, then maybe I won't get attacked, and maybe I wouldn't. Mm. It has mm -hmm. nothing to do with how someone looks, you know? It, it just, right. I mean, when people report these things, that's the first thing they ask, like, what were you wearing, right? Were you inviting them in? Right. Kind of right. Skirt. Right. So, you know, of course, you know, that might be the first place to go. Like, let me not look like what I used to look like when I was attacked. Right. Mm. But yeah. So, you know, like, even though, like, I'm not a survivor of child sexual abuse, sometimes that pushes on to me because a lot of people, like, right. people, when I was growing up, like, some old friends or their parents would be like, oh, well, um, well, even now that like I identify as pansexual, people sometimes assume that I'm queer because my mom is queer and that it rubbed off on me. Or... <laughs> it's contagious. <laughs> it's contagious. <laughs> like, it, like because like my mom was abused, this is why my mom is this way. And then they raised me in this like you know unhealthy queer household, and this is why. I'm the same that I'm this way. So they have to have a reason. They yeah, just, there's got to be a reason. Yeah. <laughs> it's not normal, so there must be a reason. Yeah. Right? So yeah. Yeah. I've had to deal with that too. Like, oh, you're just like your mom, or like, oh, because, oh, because you know she gay. That's fine. I'm like, no, no, that's not. Right. <laughs> it's not how that works. <laughs> I did really pray for it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> please, please be queer. <laughs> uh, kids to be gay as well. So. <laughs> totally. Every every day I'm like, I just want my dog to be queer. I'm just like, well, who, who else can I make queer? <laughs> and our too, so. Totally queer. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so another question for you, Mandy, is so you grew up in this household where conversations about sex and sexuality um, and sexual trauma right, were, were open parts of the conversation. And I imagine that you had friends where that absolutely was not the case for them. So how do you see those conversations having shaped who you are today and the decisions and experiences that you have had versus perhaps some of your friends who didn't have those conversations? Um, I think it shaped me tremendously, um, just in the way that I have like, I mean, even if you know, like, cause everyone has their ish, their moments when they're not the most confident, but I feel like I have a certain sense of confidence in me because I have knowledge. It's a certain mm. way you carry yourself when, <laughs> you know, you're informed about things. Like going into a situation and you know nothing, you feel just fear and you're anxious and you don't know what's gonna happen. But when I know all like A, B and C could happen, and mm -hmm. I have a plan or options about what could happen. If any of these things happen, I feel more secure and more confident going into situations. 
Because I know there's a lot of times where, like, growing up, my friends talking, dealing with guys or girls or whatever situation, they asked me for stuff when I wasn't even sexually active or I wasn't even dating because they knew that I had this type of information or this knowledge because of how I was raised. So a lot yeah. of times people ask me stuff and I'm like, well, from what I know, or, <laughs> or you know, then I would like, my opinions would go based off the information that I was given, but um, I feel like it steered me away from a lot of bad decisions. So mm. that some of my friends have made some of the things that they regretted doing or they didn't mm. know better. And for me, there's so many things that I have not done because I didn't need to, you know, because right. I knew better or because I knew, or I can connect the dots to why people do certain things. And, and there's and also, yeah. there's a mystique, I think. There's that mystique. Because I remember growing up when my mother was like, don't do that. And I'm like, but why? There was no question why. It was just like, you just don't do it because I said mm -hmm. Because I said so. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, it's that, anyway. Right. And you're so curious. And you're like, well, I'm just going to go do that thing because my mother told me not to do it. Why did you tell me not to do this? I need right. to figure it out. But because I knew everything, well, not everything, but you know, like. <laughs> I knew everything. Yeah. <laughs> about things. I, there was no need for me to go out exploring, really. Right. More than I wanted to. You know, mm -hmm. because I had zero information, so I had to do it because it was a quest for knowledge. Mm. I was like, well, I have the knowledge, and maybe I kind of want to try that. So now I can because I know going into it what I could expect, or you know, like what could possibly happen, things like that. So yeah, it was different for me going into relationships or sexual situations. Having my background, it was more. I think it was more of an easier transition than for other people who had no type of knowledge, and it was just like. The first thing they know about it is when somebody's inside them. You know, mm, you know, that's yeah. You know, when someone's trying to lay them down on the bed and mm. they don't know mm. how to say no, or I don't feel comfortable, or can we wait, or what are we doing exactly? You know, like yeah. just advocate for themselves. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, so, a little bit along that line, but in, in the sort of more quirky light uh, arena. But for both of you, what has been the most awkward conversation you have had with each other? <laughs> I don't know if it was awkward, but I remember at one point, because uh, everybody thought this was like just like, far out there. Um, at one point, she was sexually active, and I was dating. Um, I'm polyamorous, so I had like several lovers, and so. <laughs> <laughs> date one night and she had a date one night and so we negotiated how we would have dates within the house at the same time um so oh okay <laughs> so, oh, so you had a boo over and you had a boo over exactly. got you <laughs> so we, we came to a, a negotiation a, an agreement about what that would be like and so it was like doors closed music music <laughs> up <laughs> Like, I'm going to the bathroom. Right. Don't go. Exactly. So, and you know, when I tell people about that, they're like, what? So you have what? I mean, my friends too, they're like, your mom let you have people over? You got to, you got to close the door? I'm like, right, 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 right. Yeah, so like, <laughs> <laughs> yes, know, that's it was definitely out of the ordinary kind yes. of Yes. Yeah, there was never a my door in my house. All the doors were my mama's, right? <laughs> so, totally. An awkward thing for me, and I don't know why it was so awkward for me, but the when I like kind of sort of came out to you. Oh, that was funny. Yeah. I was, <laughs> I was literally like in my room, there in their room, and I sent an email like, so I'm kind of dating this girl right now. <laughs> Which is hilarious because I, like, I already know. You already know. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> that was weird for me. I mean, I think it was more weird because I've heard so many things from other people like, oh, well, you know, if your mom is gay, then that's why you're feeling this way. And I don't, I didn't want people to like automatically connect that and be right. like, oh, it's just because of your mom. And I'm like, I'm my own person with my own feelings and all my own identity. Right. And I'm at this point. I feel like I'm this and I'm dating this girl, but I was still just like, yeah. Uh, I'm like, I don't want to look at you when I tell you this. So, <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like 
my friends yet. Like, not I haven't like said the words, but I mean, I was just like, yeah, I'm dating this chick, but it yeah. wasn't really like I'm coming out as blank, blank, blank. Right. Right. So I was right. Like, like, oh my goodness, I'm actually <laughs> saying this to my mom. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Even in this open, and I think this is an important thing for parents who are engaging and wanting to have these kinds of really radically authentic and vulnerable conversations with their with their kids is like, it's awkward. It's going to sometimes be uncomfortable. There will, you know, like just because there's this open door policy doesn't mean that the jitters leave or the fear leaves or any of those things. It's just a commitment to work through them, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. That's it made me think of this funny story. I don't know if you remember this, but we used to go to a cafe ever so often and sit down and we would have these moments where it was like, um, you, um, it's like a don't get in trouble day. Or So she could ask me anything, make a statement about anything or tell me a secret or something that she did that would get me upset, but she would not get in trouble. It was like, she could just, <laughs> and, um, one day she says to me, she says, um, and you were like uh, nine, maybe 10 or something. And um, she says, I would like for you to silence your sex. <laughs> <laughs> this is before y'all worked out the music thing, right? <laughs> Mm, I was like, no, I can't do that. But what I can do is make sure you're not in the house when I have sex. And she was like, yeah. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love that there is that like opportunity to express and share. It's really, um, it's beautiful. And it really is a powerful example of sort of radical parenting, as we call it at the body is not an apology. Um, so I have two more questions. Um, and, and we're sort of com coming up on time's end, but I want to ask these two questions. As an organization that does work around bodies, um, I really am interested in what, Ignacio, for you has been your journey around healing and being in your body as a survivor of childhood sexual trauma. Um, and then for you, Mandy, what has it been? How have you learned to be in your body in this like radically honest, radically vulnerable relationship with your mom? <laughs> so um, for me, um, it, I mean, it continues to be a journey for me. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, doing this work now, I'm 45 years old, and this is something that I'm talking about from when I was a child, right? And so mm -hmm. a lot of people think that happened so long ago, you know, like, why, why are you still talking about this, right? And it is because those, um, those events um, mm -hmm. completely altered my life. Um, yeah. It changed my life. It changed how I felt about my body, um, how, the sex I wanted to have, who I wanted to share my body with. Um, and for a long time, I was not having sex with people. I was allowing people to do things to me. To me, yeah. Body experience, I was just there. And they would do whatever they wanted to do to me. And mm. they would do it because I wanted to please them, right? Mm. The best at whatever it was they wanted me to do, right? So uh, that's why it always goes back to, you know, my body, sexual healing, really coming into myself and really understanding that I have a voice in what I want, that I have desires and that I, could, I can choose what I want and not want. So, you know, talking about boundaries and negotiation is like super huge for me. And not that I'm an expert at it, you know, like I talk, I've been talking about this for the longest time and I still fuck up, you know, like I do right. really, really good sometimes and sometimes I do shitty and I mm. assess myself constantly. I have accountability buddies, you know, I work through these things. So I've designed this thing for myself where I am continually growing and learning about who I am as a sexual being and what I want and what I don't want. And so that's mm. how that experience um, really shaped my life and for a long time shaped it in a very negative way. And out of something mm. completely horrible, I've, take, I've taken something beautiful. I've turned it into something different because that cannot have control over me. So I am mm. this section of my life. Yeah. Powerful. Thank you. Um, I would say that even though we had such an open, honest, um, relationship and conversations about our bodies and everything like that. I've still dealt 
and still deal with confidence issues. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, look at the society we live in, like how could I not like question mm -hmm. if I'm beautiful or if someone else would ever think that I was beautiful or feeling comfortable in my own skin or certain outfits or whatever the case is. But I don't know, I feel like it's, it's kind of like having a background voice because like I have them in the background like, you know you're gorgeous and <laughs> cut it out you're beautiful and you're this and you're that and I'm like I know I know but I'm still a young woman and I'm still trying to find myself and yeah. that strong sense of you know that I am I'm a worthy person and all these other self-confidence things I'm trying to work on but you know there's times where it doesn't bother me and there's other times where I'm feeling very vulnerable Mm -hmm. you know it just goes to show like no matter what your upbringing is you know you're still a human at the end of the day you still have nerves and you still yeah. might feel weird and stuff so I know like I still deal with that trying to tell myself that to forget what everybody else has to say about me or how they feel about my body or whatever the case is but I just know that I try and I feel like I'm fairly successful at it not using my body to harm other people or to make other people comfortable. Because, um, yeah, like, because I know, like, there's so many people I've met throughout my life that I'm just like, you make me so uncomfortable with your body, with your presence. Mm. Like, mm. You're bombarding me, you're forcing this yeah. thing on me, and I don't like it. Like, even if mm. I'm an acquaintance, somebody that's just over the top, like, just the sexuality is just over the top, I'm like, they're making me uncomfortable. So I know mm. that I try to be more aware of how my body can make other people feel. Mm -hmm. so I try not to do certain things and move certain ways or I just try to keep in the back of my head that you never know what people's stories are what their journeys are right. so even if they don't speak on it you never yeah. know so you have to be weary about how you deal with others yeah mindful mindfulness right um I think there's something really powerful about this idea of um sort of having your mom as a voice back here, because we talk at The Body is Not an Apology about this radical self-love being our inherent self. It's actually the real voice inside of us, right? And then we get these layers of surround sound of body shame and you're not enoughness and that constant inundation of other messages. And so I think what's powerful, at least has been for me too, because I also had a mother who kind of also had that background, child, you are beautiful. That's my chocolate baby kind of <laughs> voice back there, right? <laughs> and so, right. <laughs> and so what we what ended up happening for me is that those two sounds, the sound of my radical self-love self and my mama's voice became louder than the outside voice, became louder than that voice of body shame and indoctrination. Um, and sometimes that voice still gets very loud because that is part of the world we live in, right? Every day that sound is on. And so it's easy for it to be very loud. And I think it's powerful um, that you have a, an external counter to that external chatter as well. Um, I could ask you all a bazillion questions because I find you awesome and fascinating. And I think this project that you're working on is so powerful and is really going to just um, help a lot of people heal, help a lot of people avoid the kind of traumas that you have had to heal from, um, and just create more powerful bonds between parents and their kids. And so, um, thank you all for letting me be a part of this journey and a part of this conversation with you today. I appreciate it. As well. oh, thank you. Um, all the work you're doing is important as well. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And, um, yeah, so this uh, is going to be hosted on The Body Is Not an Apology yeah. website. So check out The Body Is Not an Apology. Subscribe to their website. Um, subscribe to the, our YouTube channel, um, Pure Love Talks. Um, get on our mailing list, purelovetalks at gmail.com. Uh, thank you for all your support. And please continue to send in questions. Yes. Um, and if you are interested in interviewing us and hosting us on your website, please let us know. Just email us. Bye, everyone. Bye.